Good evening. Thank you for joining us for this installation of Placemakers. And so for those of you that are not familiar with Placemakers, it is a public speaker series that was initiated last year by our organization to describe our work in the redevelopment of East Village. Uh, this is the third installation. Uh, the first installation we dealt with the role of public art in East Village and how public art was helping to shape our personality. We followed up on the second series by talking about public spaces and programming. And in that discussion, we were talking really about how uh, those spaces are being programmed to entice and encourage engagement across all communities. Tonight, we're talking about use of language. Awesome. <laughs> so tonight, as I noted, there are four presentations, and that's going to be followed by a question and answer period, and there's going to be people joining on, on, on stage, and that's when you really get to engage with the team that's delivering the new Central Library project. Um, before I turn it over to Bill uh, and introduce Bill, I wanted to acknowledge a few people in the audience, and so maybe you can play. From uh, the board of the Calgary Public Library, we have Jim Hutchinson. There's Jim. From the City of Calgary, David Down. From Calgary Municipal Land Corporation, our president and CEO, Mike Brown. And our lovely counselor, Drew Farrell, here in the front. Okay. So let's, let's get started, because there's, the, there's a lot to talk about when it gets, you know, when we start talking about the Central Library. So our first speaker is Bill Tassett. Bill is the, the CEO of the Calgary Public Library. Now let me, please indulge me while I read to you his bio here. Bill joined the Calgary Public Library early in 2014 from the King County Library System in Western Washington. During his 25-year tenure, Bill's vision and leadership kept King County Library System at the forefront of public libraries, championing technological advancements, collection management, and attracting significant growth. Under his leadership there, uh, the Library Journal noted the Library of the Year in 2011 to the, to the King County Public Library System, so quite, quite a remarkable accomplishment. And then Seattle Municipal League's Outstanding Civic Organization was also awarded to that organization in 2012. So now steering the Calgary Public Library as the CEO, Bill has managed unprecedented growth of over 100,000 new members, uh, championing the elimination of the library membership fees, uh, the removal of those fees, opening the door to every Calgarian, and is led by his passion to share his library know-how with young Calgary Public Library leaders for future generations. Please join me in welcoming Phil Tassett. I'd like to introduce a few other of our board members, Shirley Samuels, for me. <clears throat> And Don Pauly. I can't see uh, that it's kind of light up here. Is there any other of our board members? Raise your hand. Oh, yeah, I just, I just made it. There you go. Okay, I can't let this evening go by without mentioning the fact that Janet, our board chair, is here with her husband, Dino. And would you believe it that tonight is his 60th birthday? <laughs> so, let me do this, I guess. Here we go. So, tonight we're here to talk about our great new central library, which is located in a great public space and is the cornerstone of a great library system. I think everyone in the audience would be disappointed if we were thinking that it would be anything less than all three accounts. And if you're talking to one of our members of the foundation, they'd probably say it all adds up to having the best public library in the world. So great libraries are inextricably tied to the lives of the people of the community. Great libraries help to define communities and they contribute to the life of the community by ensuring that all citizens, and in this case all Calgarians, have access to knowledge, information, culture, and stories. They help a community be more literate. On top of all that, they're the place where people go to experience community. 
So according to the folks from the Project for Public Space, as I was talking to Susan, we actually uh, we've encountered those people, and they're really interesting. And they have some really great theories about what makes a really interesting place. It's not just the facility. It's not just the infrastructure. They say there are four attributes that lead to a strong sense of place, which, when successful, can influence the physical, social, and emotional, and ecological health of individuals and communities. That's a mouthful. But anyway, the, the four uh, attributes are comfort, image, access, and linkage, sociability, and uses and activities. So later on, Carson, Kate, Craig, and Craig will talk to you about the design and construction of the building and how it will address those first three attributes. What I want to do is talk to you about the uses and activities that will be embedded in this new building and in the new community of East Village. By the way, they have a little model. They got a website with a little model. Since the idea of the new central library came about, there have been several engagement activities in which 20,000 Calgarians shared their support as well as their thoughts and dreams. The overwhelming message in all those engagements was that they wanted more. More spaces, more community and digital connections, more programs, more for teens, more for kids and families, more languages, more innovation. You get it. You get the idea. Just more of everything. But we listen, and I'm giving you the facts about the new library. The new facility will have 240,000 square feet. The new central library will have 42 bookable spaces for up to 950 people. 16 of those spaces will be for small groups of 10 or less. Other general seating of 675 will be located throughout the public spaces in the building. The TD Great Reading Room will surround up to 140 readers in the traditions and trappings of books and libraries that are sure to inspire. On top of that, there'll be two cafes with spaces for over 100 people. The Shake Family Welcome Gallery will accommodate over 500 people for a single event. Think about the Bob Edwards Gala as we have right now. You know that our, our foundation is thinking that way. And a theater or a public forum, we can see 350, 340 people but even more with the overflow adjacent space. It's my goal, ultimately, to have all sorts of book clubs meeting up there in that space to connect to the public forum as well. You know, but simply making more space isn't good enough. The principles of placement can tell us that the activities and uses are the building blocks of the place. Similarly, we heard in our public engagements that people wanted unique experiences in the new library. They wanted something that they couldn't find in their home, that they couldn't find on their computer, they couldn't even find in their community. Now we know this for a fact, but we know a lot about this in the people that we're serving. As mentioned by Susan, we had 6.2 million people visit libraries last year. That was up a million people from the previous year. And eliminating the $12 fee for library cards has seen the number of Calgarians with library cards grow to more than 500,000. In 2015, we added 135 new patrons. As a result of this great response, it's caused us to keep asking the question, what will we keep these people coming back? What do we, what do we have to do? So one thing we know is that events and programs give people more enjoyable, interesting, and educational experiences. It's a deep reason why people will come to a place like the library again and again. We've charged our service design team, and these are the people who create all the programs and services in our library. It's a special group of, you know, like big thinkers and whatnot, and this is all they do is come up with programs and ideas for services. We've charged them to look at all of the spaces in the new central library, and with the help of outside expertise, we want them to develop the first six months of programming for the new central library, for the entire library. So when I talk about outside expertise, we're talking about, as an example, uh, we know that the people who do maybe the best job of anyone for uh, local history and digitizing local history are the folks who are public library. And we're going to bring them in, we're going to work with them. And the same will be true with technology and early literacy spaces, and, and the list goes on. So back to the ideas of, uh, back to the ideas of great places. 
It's our aim that the activities, events, and programs at the new central library will be all of these fun, active, vital, <coughs> special, real, useful, local, celebratory, and sustainable. These are the intangible qualities of things that people do in great places. It will also, at the same time, be our criteria as we build a menu of activities for the new central library. <laughs> You'll know more about this in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but ultimately, the new central library will be a place of surprise and excitement. Fresh, exciting, relevant to the citizens of Calgary and visitors from around the world. And while we promise Kate that we're not trying to move a fire truck into the new library, we're not promising that it won't be part of the current central library. The point is that we're not waiting to create great programming until we open the doors to the new central library. We're testing new vibrant programming today in the current library and libraries across the system. For example, we're working with incredible partners like the University of Calgary to animate today's central library, offering the Think Big series with the Hotchkiss Brain Institute to sold out for any new audiences. Learning what appeals to Calgary's adults in preparation for what will offer at the new central library. By the way, the sellout attendance at these events was the motivation for only this place makers event tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're getting over the stage to local musicians and letting teams turn up the volume for pet concerts on the main floor of today's Central Library as we plan concerts for the new Central Library. Our colossal Calgary playdates are hugely successful, attended by toddlers with moms, dads, grandparents, or caregivers on the second floor of this library. Imagine what we're going to be able to do in the new central library. And last weekend, our most audacious partner, the Calgary Public Library Foundation, helped us welcome more than 400 kids to the junior junos at the central library's John Young Theater. This third theater, a week ago, had 400 kids in it. Well, the new Central Library is a fully funded project. The Library's Foundation is actively and successfully ensuring a sustainable future for this library and all of Calgary's <coughs> community libraries in its annual campaign. Add in is a bold and transformational initiative to invest in the potential of all Calgarians and the future of our city. The activities we're planning for the New Central Library are being influenced by the bold design of the New Central Library. But that design is also at the same time generating ideas for the future that we're testing out and trying today as we renovate existing libraries such as the Judith Umbach Library, the Forest Lawn Library, and the Mills Hill Library later this year. And as we build new libraries, the library at Westbrook Station, which is going to open, by the way, on April 23rd, coming up in a few weeks. Corey Park, Rocky Ridge, Seaton, and Simon's Gap. So some of these concepts include lighted shelving, comfortable and contemporary furniture, the arrangement and wayfinding for collections and services within libraries, and themed collections for children and adults to make finding just the right book easier, and at the same time highlighting the incredible expertise of knowledge in our staff. And conversely, we're, we're, ideas are coming out of the community libraries and they're helping to shape what we're going to do in the new central library. Because like every single one of our community libraries, a place, uh, it's a place that belongs to everyone and everyone is welcome. I can't help but think of Mayor Nation's comments at the opening and the dedication of the Junior Times Library. When he kind of said, you know, talking to himself, why do we put so much money in the libraries? People ask me all the time, why are we building a new central library? And he said, and then I thought about it. Mary could somebody who three months earlier had been in a refugee camp. He's sitting at a computer at a newly refurbished Chicken Dunn Park Library at the top of the middle. I'll be here. So, again, some of the ideas that we've uh, incorporated the reading room, the teen area, free and accessible meeting rooms to support the community, and as you can see, the early learning center at Fish Creek and some to be at Village Square. We've come to understand that play is the foundation for all future learning, and we're using that concept to create dynamic, interactive installations. Eventually, all of our libraries, including the New Central Library, will have that kind of facility. The idea and the potential of the New Central Library has been a point of pride from the moment the idea was conceived. 
I know the city staff, people who work for the city and they're up above there, peer down every day and they, uh, with a, they look at the construction site with the thought that they're part of this, they're part of something big and something very important. I know construction workers, architects, and engineers on the project make it a point to tell the people uh, that they know that they're involved with the project. Eli, who we met this afternoon on a, on a tour of the site, he's a construction manager, an incredible guy, and everything else. He wanted me to make sure that you knew that everybody working on that project were proud and flattered to be part of the new central library. Our current and past library board members are proud of this effort and its influence on the entire system is leading its launch to be filled with inspiring awe. Our many dedicated donors feel a strong sense of civic pride at the thought of the possibilities created by a great space of the New Central Library. You know, ultimately, the New Central Library will be considered a great space if it becomes a place where the areas where to celebrate, where social and economic exchanges occur, where friends run into each other, and where cultures mix. The new central library will be a great building. It will be a community library for an exciting new community at East Village. It will be Calgary's signature library for a great library system, a library system that can and will transform the lives of all our lives. Thank you. because it's just going to uh, grow and grow here. So um, next on the project team, I want to introduce to you Carson Kotnick, who's the project manager at Stuart Olson. So let me tell you a little bit about Carson. He began his career as a structural steel welder in the skilled trades prior to returning to university to become a civil engineer. As project manager with Stuart Olson, he has been instrumental in developing Stuart Olson's building information modeling, virtual design and construction department, and is a strong advocate of the integration of technology and construction. He has been a guest lecturer at both the University of Calgary and SAID. He places a strong focus on mentorship and education. He has led the project, uh, he is the lead project manager for me on the new central library program and, and along with the ambitious LRT encapsulation program. And we're thrilled to have him here today, Carson Mano. started here. So I'm here today to talk about the actual construction and the development of the new Central Library. So I have the opportunity in a very interesting uh, line of work where I get to live in this world between uh, great folks that come from the Calgary Public Library, come from CMLC, I get to work with the dynamic international design team, and then I get to work with the other half of our world, which is the people every day who do the physical work. These are the people who are out on our construction site with shovels. Uh, they're putting the steel in place. They're pouring our concrete. They do, uh, they do some very difficult, challenging work. And so I get to live in this world where I have the branch between both. So it's a very dynamic day to day. Uh, I don't often get to look like this uh, as much as I like it. Most of the time I'm living and working out on the construction sites. And that's, uh, that's where we like to be. And that's how we get the job done. So, as far as building this project, one of, the, one of my favorite questions I've been asked is, is it different to build this than the other projects you've worked on? And I've, I've been very lucky in my career. Uh, I, when, I, when I look at this building, I often, I often worry what I'm going to do next because uh, I've been the peak of my career already. <laughs> but um, you know, I've, I've had the great pleasure of working with our uh, great friends and neighbors at Bull Valley College. Um, and that was just prior to this, so I haven't moved too far. I moved across the street. and. But with this building, uh, and, and back to the question, is it different? It's, it's an easy answer, absolutely. It's very different. It's, uh, it's very special. It's very personal. Uh, it's exciting. You know, it, doesn't, it, it truly doesn't get much better than this. And what's different and exciting about this is this building is built for all of the right reasons. 
and that's that's something very special to be a part of. You know, the building is done with an environmentally sustainable focus, and that's something for all of us to be proud of. It's a building that represents the Calgary Public Library and everything that Bill's touched on, which are all things that are going to shape this city and be proud and make us all proud Calgarians. Uh, it's monumental in, in the upcoming and, uh, and here today community of East Village. Uh, I'm hoping the movie in the parks are back this summer. My vote is for Jurassic World. <laughs> um, so as far as building, we'll, uh, we're going to start with what we originally had. So that's where we started. It was a parking lot just east of City Hall. You would have looked at it and, and as, as the design team had the pleasure of working through, a very challenging site. When you look at this, uh, obviously the site is direct, or basically cut right in half. Uh, right off the bat, we had basically two construction sites to work with. So, right off the bat, we, we had a lot of challenges. There was a lot of uh, innovation that went into how are we going to do this. Uh, we got the pleasure of being in that construction management role and being on board right from day one, getting to work with uh, right at the start of that concept design um, with our friends from Snowhead and Dialogue and the rest of the design team. So, the very first problem, uh, as we all can see, and then we all live today, was the LRT encapsulation. So, um, we'll jump into a little bit of what that's about, but just a quick snapshot of there's where we are today. So, it looks very, very different. We've now had the LRT encapsulation in place, and that has unified our site. That has shaped a lot of the design and enabled us to actually build the library. So before we began building what we see here, we had to start with encapsulating the train. Now that was a first of its kind project for the city of Calgary. A uh, very complicated, small piece of work that was integral to this building. Now, a big challenge for us was being able to provide this structure, uh, which ultimately enables us to build the central library but we had to do it without disrupting Calgary Transit and without disrupting the flow of our citizens' commutes into downtown. So a very key integral part. You'll notice the last piece there was completed on time. So that was very important to, uh, to everybody involved. Um, and, and it was a very unique structure. We had a, a lot of innovation, a lot of thinking went into how are we going to do this while keeping the trains running, minimal disruption to Calgary Transit, and, uh, and then also having an integral to the structure of the Calgary Public Library. So, uh, a few key pieces. We did all of the foundations to this building, which go up to 33 meters underground. Uh, massive, massive foundations, piles that go in the ground that are six, six feet in diameter, 33 meters deep. That's big, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> From there, there was a lot of innovative ways as to how you make the walls. The walls had to be constructed using a, a one-sided um, construction method. We actually put in a panel that allowed us to build the concrete and pour the concrete just from one side. Uh, the, the big showpiece was, of course, the roof. So the roof was done in 53 panels. Each panel was uh, made as precast concrete, so made off-site. And once those panels were completed, over one weekend, which we thankfully got a, a shutdown and by um, basically getting on our knees for Calgary Transit and begging, begging forgiveness, but we got one weekend and we did the whole thing in about 43 hours. That entire, there's no roof. People who left work Friday afternoon came into work Monday morning and the, the tunnel was there. So when we move on to the design, uh, the design we all see, we all love, it's, it's going to make a, an unbelievable facility but it makes, makes our lives very interesting. The whole, the whole team from design to construction, um, we've all had to look at things in different ways. One of the bad words we have on the project site is uh, we never want to hear, but we've always done it this way. Because that does not apply here. Uh, so this is a snapshot. Um, when, when we talked about technology a little bit, this project demands sort of the cutting and the leading edge as to how building technology integrates into actual construction. And this is a real shot. This is actually something we use every day. This is our live existing model. 
our construction model. You can see some of the highlights of the, the big trust members, some of the, the big fancy heavy pieces that go into building the structure of the new central library. Um, technology, once again, is, is a huge integral part with all of the, the geometry and the compound curves. You can't lay out a building traditionally. It's not a square, it's not a box, you don't have uh, 90 degree grid lines. Here we work all in points in space. So they're all X, Y, Z coordinates. And everything we lay out, every piece that makes it on this construction site is all developed and virtually constructed before we actually do it in real life. And that's good in a lot of ways. That creates more work up front for us, but it enables us to when we get out to the construction site and we've done it in the virtual world, uh, you can never perfectly eliminate things, but it definitely helps eliminate or minimize uh, any issues we experience out in the construction site. <coughs> so another piece to building the new central library is looking at it from how do you build and you build a cultural facility. And that is different than building other types of projects. Um, we, we have the, the pleasure of once again working with the Calgary Public Library and feeling the passion from Bill, you know, that does, uh, as he said, we were on site today with Eli, and it directly translates to everybody we work with, right down to, um, you know, myself, including everyone on the construction site, our laborers, all of our electricians to our plumbers, you name it, everybody gets to truly feel that sense of pride, and then you can see it when you walk through the construction site. Um, we often have a reminder once in a while, because it's still work, it's still the daily grind, but when we look at what we're building and we remember what that is, uh, it makes everyone push that extra mile. I, uh, I, I threw up the, the Calgary Public Library um, sort of mission statement because it, it directly applies and that's something that we're actually living today. The, uh, the mission to inspire life stories, and we already have lots. You know, everyone involved in this project is developing life stories and, and some pretty exciting ones uh, every day, and that's that's truly special. When it comes to culture, we also have tackled this project in a somewhat different way than you see in regular construction. We've all had to really truly integrate together as a project team. It doesn't necessarily mean we're all friends every day, but when we all leave the meeting <laughs> room, we are. And and that's it's it's huge. It's, it's the only way we can successfully deliver something like this and do it on the correct timeline, hit our scheduled dates, and it, it involves us all integrating and truly working together. And and that's challenging to do when you have disciplines and in disciplines that we don't normally deal with. We have uh, obviously a lot of uh, acoustic items coming from the training and vibrations. That's something that's uh, very important to the usage of the library. You know, we don't want that to disrupt how anything happens, how anything operates. Um, and then straight through to your, your standard disciplines of scene construction from structural to mechanical to electrical, we, we truly have to all work together. And it's, it's, it's something that um, has enabled us to really move forward on this project. Okay. So another big piece of the culture which I touched on earlier is this culture of sustainability. And the Calgary Public Library, um, along with the entire design team, has done a really good job. And, and it's now our job as a construction management team to execute that and make that a reality. Um, there's a lot of big things, there's a lot of really exciting things that are happening with this library that are going to enable us to move into the future once again doing the right thing, doing the right thing for the environment. Um, well, one of my favorites, uh, which is the second one on the list there, Every piece of waste that comes from that construction site, everything you know, we have the bins, it looks like it's just thrown in the bin. But those bins are taken off site, sorted, and 75% of all of the waste that comes from that construction site is recycled. It does not go to a dump. So that's uh, something we're pretty proud of. It's also a different project to build in the sense that we get to be part of the big picture. And that big picture being the community of East Village and the city of Calgary as a whole. What we're doing you know, for the Calgary Public Library and what the Calgary Public Library does for the citizens of Calgary um, and the neighborhood of East Village as a whole is, is something that's truly special and, and once again makes this project 
different than what uh, than what you may experience in, in a regular job. We we get the chance to uh, to be a part of that team, and within that, to be able to build this project success successfully, we've had to really understand what it's like to be part of that community, live downtown, uh, enjoy the river walk, have lunch at Simmons Building. Uh, it's, it's something that's truly exciting and, and enables us to understand what CMLC's vision is and what Power Public Library's vision is to deliver this project in the way that they intended it to. So we're going to touch on some scheduled milestones, uh, the important stuff that everybody wants to hear. Um, this year is a big year. This year is when we're going to see the project really come together. This, once again, is from our, our model software here. And this year, so by Christmas time this year, when you walk by the library, you're going to see the structure will be there. And that's going to be really exciting. We'll see the shape. Uh, we'll see the magnitude. We'll see the size. And then from there, we're uh, as well by Christmas time, we're going to have started the facade. So we're going to start the building exterior. And what will be really exciting is we'll get to see what it looks like. So the, the picture on the left is one of my favorites. Um, everything on this building, once again, is, isn't done uh, the way we always do it. Um, obviously, uh, an exciting piece is the exterior of the, of the building. And, uh, and it's unique. It's something that's been custom made for this job. Um, it's truly unique just to this library. So we, We've had the experience and, and we've been able to, to ensure this works for the library and meet our energy requirements and meet uh, everything from studying how the sun affects the building. We've actually built this and, and mocked it up in real life. And that's a uh, three stories tall of what the actual building facade is going to look like. And, uh, and it looks just as good, if not better, in real life than it does in the pictures. So that uh, brings us into 2017. In 2017, we're going to complete the building exterior. And uh, from, from, from the street, and it's going to start looking like the finalized building. We're going to start seeing what the final product's going to look like. Um, as we're moving into 2017, we're going to really be focusing, and the majority of our work will be on the interior finishes. We'll be working on the flooring, the woodwork, the ceilings, the drywall walls, uh, everything that goes within that building, that will shift to being our main focus. As we keep moving and we get into the later parts of 2017, uh, we'll be shifting gears um, well, more in parallel. We'll be continuing on the inside, but uh, shifting gears to the exterior. So um, one of the most exciting parts uh, as, as we walk through the pass-through, which connects East Village to downtown, and we get to experience the the Western Red Cedar underbelly, um, that's going to start happening, as well as all of the all of the hardscaping, the concrete work, uh, the sidewalks, that's all going to start happening later in 2017. So once again, from the exterior, it's truly going to look like it's final product. Moving into 2018, we're, we're on the home stretch. Uh, it, it'll be a, a big focus to keep things moving, to keep the pace. And we'll be starting to, as we come into spring, we'll be really focusing on getting the landscaping, so what we see in this picture, um, the different planters, the vegetation, the trees, and that's going to be bringing us closer and closer to the final product. So as we get into fall of 2018, um, that'll be the big time. That's when we're getting ready to, the library will have been moving in for a few months prior to that, and we'll be getting ready to open the doors. sufficient time for Craig Deggers, who's visiting from Stonehenge, and our next presenter, which is Kate Thompson. Kate is the Vice President of Projects for Calgary Municipal Land Corporation. And in Kate's day-to-day -day job, she manages this. This is her, she does a lot of things at CMLC, but, but the new central library is near and dear to her heart. So she leads our projects division. She's responsible for the delivery of the master plan um, for East Village. 
She is uh, currently leading the new Central Library Project team. She's going to tell you about that, just the, the, uh, the protocols and processes involved in coordinating such a large effort. Uh, she's a registered member of the Alberta Architects Association and an active member of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. She uh, manages the architectural controls for East Village. She joined our team in 20, is it test? 13. Please welcome Ms. Thompson. CMLC's role is in all of this work and hopefully enlighten you kind of the scope of what we're, what we're talking about. So how I'm going to talk to you about this is I'm going to talk to you about what we do. I'm also going to talk to you about how we do it. And then I'll relate it back to uh, the New Central Library and how that all works together in this monumental project for all of us. I think as Susan said that you can kind of secure the prize going through and have the slides that speak to that towards the end. So first to start about what we do. First of all, what and where, I guess, is the, the appropriate uh, the appropriate name for this topic is where is East Village and where is the north half of the Rivers District? So we are looking at uh, a broader context, but where we focus a lot of our energy in the last five or so years is within East Village. So I'm going to quickly run through some of the projects, some of the what uh, that we've done to give you a sense of scope, and then maybe you'll kind of understand how the how makes sense. So, what do we do? Planning is at the center of everything we've done uh, to date in terms of starting this project. This is a project that I'm very, very uh, proud to be a part of, but it started way before me, and it started way before even probably anyone at our, uh, at our firm today, and I think there needs to be an acknowledgement of all that effort and time and decades of thinking about how do we bring these village together. So, planning to make really livable, pedestrian-friendly, uh, viable communities. So what does it take to make that community? The first part is streetscapes. Livable, uh, pedestrian-friendly, pedestrian-scale streetscapes. We've done about just over four kilometers worth of streetscapes and sidewalks today. We have just over about a kilometer left to go. So when you think of we are for a run, when you think of how long that is and how many, how many minutes or uh, how much time that takes, it takes a lot longer to build. And then it does to run. <laughs> um, we've got parks. I've, I've never seen so much opportunity in terms of parks and landscaping. We had a whole place made for a session dedicated just to this, but you know, not many times in your career do you get to work on a 31 acre island in the middle of a river or the river walk, which became the conduit of all the people coming to the village. Uh, not to mention the small but important urban plazas that we have within our, within our um, boundary area and the library forms a huge part of that new parks and plazas. It's not just a, a building stand alone. We'll get to that as well. You might get to that. <laughs> Bill's probably singing earlier, and I'm not doing it. So. <laughs> there we go, connection. So another big part of what we do is also connect. You can't have a neighborhood that's isolated. I think that's elementary and fundamental to any good planning. We've obviously done bridges and underpasses, and just getting the people into the space has been fundamental to creating the space. Public art forms a huge part of the backdrop to our neighborhood. Again, we had a placemaker session dedicated just to that. I learned so much about how the mosaic is built for that second picture down in terms of Ron Moffat's uh, piece in this uh, village. It's expanded and, and covers the whole area and is uh, really important for not only the residents, but the, the users and the, the Calgarians at large, uh, especially coming down Riverwalk if you're using the regional pathway system. Uh, we also have uh, really blessed with four heritage assets. As Susan mentioned, we're going to be talking about that in the next series. They, they, you see the first picture there with Simon, those who have the opportunity to get uh, a drink or a coffee or any of the great food at Simmons right now have experienced it firsthand. It's, it provides the texture to the neighborhood that is so so needed to a neighborhood that's building out so rapidly. St. Louis as well and uh, the other the larger cultural institutions, the National Music Center, which was front and center 
this past week at the Junos, and obviously in the library for the cultural uh, piece within the building. So layer them all together, and it's, wow, we're extremely lucky to be doing what we do and where we do it. So now we get into how do we do it? There's, there's no man behind the curtain or woman behind the curtain. It's, it's really about thinking holistically about what are our objectives? What are we trying to do what, with each of those projects? Each of the objectives are different, whether it be cost or schedule or quality. Usually everyone wants all three. And, you know, Bill's starting up to be talking about how to, how to get collaborating faster and better. And you might see the grinning in the front row, and we'll see about that. But everyone's objectives need to be met, uh, met when you're delivering a project. So the best thing to do is understand what those objectives are at the start and try to meet them, or you know, hopefully in a lot of the cases you see them. So when we're talking about how we do it, we have to start with our core team. And a lot of you are sitting out in the back, and actually the ones are still sitting here. But, uh, we have a really small, nimble, fantastic team. They all have a different background, which I love. And I think our management team has really uh, worked hard to get, covering a range of these specialties that you see up within the circle. And without that small team, we're only about 17 people. <coughs> We're spread over three floors in the Heritage Building, so we operate like a 300-person law firm. But, um, <laughs> but we really are all working together, and I think that's really that's made the difference to, to a lot of the projects. And we're able to communicate on a, a daily basis, an hourly basis, about what are our objectives, how are we going to meet them, what, what are we trying to do here. So just to speak about what CMLC's role is generally in most of our projects and how we approach them and what the division is, because there's always there's always a desire to just kind of drive ahead and, and, and just start the project, get it done, and move forward. But we really need to take stock and see how are we going to do this and why are we doing this. So when you look at CMLC as a leader for a lot of these um, projects, we divide the projects into two. So we talk about the why and the what on one side. And the why and the what is why are we building a pedestrian bridge? Why, what is the pedestrian bridge servicing? And who we need to put on that side too? And really understanding through engagement through all of our partners and the city and Calgarians at large. I mean, we're not building any of these projects for ourselves. As much as I'd love to have the uh, rooftop bar to myself for family gathering events, it's really not for me. Um, it is for Calgarians at large. So the why and the what are fundamental to all projects. And then we become the mediator of how. So we know what you want and why you want it. Now, how the heck do we get there and how do we deliver it? So, Usually on the how side is the design and construction. They're helping service us and figure out, you know, how do we put a train uh, in the underneath the library? And on the other side is why are we putting a train underneath the library? So we're all working together. And here we go. So as we referenced it before, none of this is for us. This is really all for the larger community of Calgary and the citizens. So these are a few shots of uh, our engagement for the library, one case where we were telling, I'm sure a lot of you were there, uh, to, to reveal the design. It was a fantastic event. We had over, over a thousand people. And we heard feedback, uh, largely, uh, overwhelmingly positive, I would say. You know, the pride really, um, really increased with that project. So I'm talking about what we do. I to speak about how we do it. And then how does that relate to the new central library, which you know, we thought we'd test our vertical development with a quarter of a billion dollar project. So just to start off small and, and see how you go. Uh, nothing like diving in uh, head first. So when we think of the, uh, the new central library, this is obviously the site of the new central library. We didn't know it would look like this shape, just to be clear when we started looking at it. But now we all know what the shape is, so we'll just use this in this slide. We need to really understand for all of our projects, and this one in particular, what are we doing for access? How do people get to there? So whether that is the traverse going over to Inglewood or it's the C square where people are walking through on their way to work, how do we get there and how do we have access to space? This one is obviously challenged in terms of the how do we, how do we build over top of the current uh, rising curving train. But we went out and figured that out. So we figured out some solutions before we even got started. Dramatic pauses. Okay. We also think of connections. Obviously, nothing is done in isolation, but some projects actually spur new projects, which our project team really loves um, to add new projects and layer it on. But this project, uh, in particular, we have uh, new um, 
municipal building that's one of the biggest built since the 80s Olympics. It's a huge uh, part of the central part of Calgary. And we have completely uh, ignored Third Street. Uh, not, not out of design or not a, out of intent, but just over time, it, it, this hadn't been a part of our scope, so that became a project that we added on to the uh, live uh, to the East Village infrastructure project to make sure that all access and connections to the site were, were worthy of uh, this new investment. Obviously, another big connection point is all of the public spaces we have throughout um, East Village, um, some of which have been redesigned and upgraded, and some of which we're just looking at right now in terms of Olympic Plaza and where that could go and how that would collectively form uh, the urban landscape that surrounds it now. So how do we build the right team? Because I think, uh, I think all of us have been a part of big projects or small projects, and I, I, I don't think anyone can stand up here and say, I did it all. Uh, it's always a we. Uh, there's a ton of people behind each of us uh, who are speaking today. So I just want to talk a little bit about this library project. When uh, CMLC first got started, uh, some of the thinking at the time was that we would do uh, a traditional design competition. So we'd go out there and get the best and the brightest, and we'd send them away with our wish list and have them come back and give us their jewel box. And then we'd all sit around and say, ooh, I like that, or not so much as pink, if it was only for me, or whatever you have to say. And what we said, collectively uh, with the library team and the city and CMLC, we said, is that the right decision for this project? So again, to how we approach each project differently on a case-by-case -case basis, we really wanted to make the best library, the best community hub for Calgary. Not necessarily the best toolbox for Calgary. So we, we rethought how we went out to get the team. And we really, I think this, um, the title is really important. We needed the right team. And the right team for us collectively, when we talk about our objectives, was a team that listened, not just spoke. Um, and you'll hear, uh, Craig is an amazing speaker, but what you won't hear today is his listening skills, nor the whole team behind him, how they actually listen through the process. And that's, I think, on this side of the fence, now that I can see, is probably a more valuable skill than anything else in terms of uh, an architect being able to translate uh, the, the wishes of a group and the community. So to build the right team, we went up to the community. We had 38 international teams come back. Uh, that was on the eve of the flood. Luckily, we put everything on the third floor. Um, and we, you know, I think it's a source of pride. Uh, Mike and I often talk about this was right during the flood. My basement had seven feet in it. Everyone was uh, in trouble. Uh, and we still stuck to our timelines. And we really got the best team out of it. Um, and that was really important to meet all of our objectives. So what we asked everyone to do of the four finalists was to come to us and fit into it context model. We have this model, the wood model, built by a student at the University of Calgary who are involving the U of C as well. And it was really great to see, compare these schemes at the same scale so that you really could see what everyone was thinking. And we were, didn't, the outcome of the design wasn't so much about getting the <laughs> same, um, getting the final picture and then building that. It was about seeing the capacity to understand the site and to build from that, and how the team worked uh, collectively together. So this, obviously, was the uh, winning um, uh, team, and it wasn't necessarily the winning project, but the winning team that came to the forefront. They, they were very um, crafty in handing up to the jury. We each had these beautiful wooden models that we fondled for a couple hours that they talked, and they were totally distracted, and I'm not really sure what they said, but it was great. <laughs> <laughs> and they caught it anyways. Uh, and that was fantastic, but what they also did is reconceive the whole site. And I'll leave that to Craig to talk about the specifics, but what was really powerful for us, too, was the collective of the dialogue and Snow had a team that came and how they, everyone spoke and everyone participated uh, in the ideation and the solutions that they brought to the table. So if I reflect back on how our team for the library is reflected back to all the other work, this is kind of how the team has been spread out. We follow the same process to select Carson and his team at uh, uh, Stuart Olson, and we follow the same for the final design and for also for our project manager, and the family, which Carol is here. Uh, we also have a huge amount of people uh, helping us with the what and why to get us to where we need to go. I think behind each org chart, there should be a picture like this. 
there are so many people, many of you are in the crowd, and I'm sorry if your picture didn't make it up here, but there are, you probably won't be able to tell anyways, but thank you. None of this gets done without community support, and this doesn't even show the 100 plus people every day that are on site that Carson mentioned, but all of these people, I sent out a collective email and said, please send me something, uh, headshots, so that we can acknowledge you, because I think it's really important. This doesn't get done alone, and I think it's great uh, signal of how many Calgarians, and there's a few New Yorkers in there as well, are, are making this happen. So it's, it's a testament to the overall excitement of the project. So I think, just to close, we have a fantastic team, I can't say that enough, but who you don't see up here is any of the teams who are, you know, texting away after their interview was done uh, when they kind of checked out. You don't see a partner for the firm that decided not to bring any of his team aboard and didn't allow anyone to speak. What you really see is a representative of a greater team, and I think that speaks volumes to how we've been able to pull this together. So, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Kurt Dikers from Snowheda. Snowheda is an international practice with major offices in New York and Oslo, as well as seven, several other smaller studios around the world. As one of the founding partners of Snowheda, Craig Dikers has led many of Snowheda's prominent projects internationally. After establishing the Oslo studio with his colleagues in 1989, Craig now manages the practice with his partners in both the U.S. and North America. Craig's work includes the exquisite Alexander Library. If you haven't seen it, it's just extraordinary. The Norwegian National Opera and Ballet in Oslo, the September 11th Memorial Museum Pavilion in New York, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art Expansion, the New Times Square Reconstruction, and now the Calgary New Central Library. Calgary has a strong interest in, or Craig has a strong interest in design as a promoter of social and physical well-being, and those values are clearly demonstrated in this work. So Hannah is one of the seven shortlisted firms in consideration for the Obama Presidential Center in Chicago. So welcome back to Calgary. and the art of, of building is a long and laborious process. It's perhaps the slowest of all the professions. It takes a great deal of time and effort and a great deal of patience to make a building truly uh, come to life. Uh, I was fortunate enough to come here, in, which I figured out tonight was actually 10 years ago, uh, for the first time, before there was a program for this project, before there was a place to put it um, before there was a collective who wanted it and truly, truly knew how to get it done. Uh, and I met people in this library, in this very building, and I talked to them about our experiences in Egypt and listened to them talk about their thoughts and, and uh, dreams for a new library in Calgary. And I can say there was a great deal of joy in the room when I talked to those people. And that's because having an idea brings us joy it allows us to see into the future and to imagine a better place where we might find ourselves. After some time, we were able to receive the commission to make the design for the building. And once you begin to design, which is a kind of an abstract idea, where you try to conceive of something that is three-dimensional and, and very large often, and you conceive of it in, in two dimensions sometimes, and in a very small scale, this requires a great deal of faith. Uh, you have to believe in what you're doing. You have to believe somehow that what you're doing will make a difference. And that uh, this, this process has, has a future. As the design process transforms into the construction process, you suddenly realize 
that you're hoping that it will get done. <laughs> you're hoping that there won't be any terrible uh, problems, things that get in the way. There are many, many uh, things that can prevent a process, even during construction, from being completed. So there's a great deal of hope uh, that um, I think all of us feel as we place the concrete and the steel on the site. And I also felt that today when I met some of the great construction team out there. <clears throat> at least they didn't throw anything at me, so that was a good sign. Um, hopefully all of that hope will lead us back to a sense of joy. So once the building is complete, we will have forgotten about all the times we didn't believe it would happen. And we will once again re regain the sense of joy that those first few people had when they began to think about this project so many years ago. Uh, we've been very fortunate to work with a partner architect here in Calgary, and you probably know their name, Dialog. They've been a, a wonderful partner, and this is as much due to their efforts as ours, so I really feel very privileged to speak on all our behalf tonight. Um, well, we're named after a mountain, and that's our mountain on the right, and of course these are things you're not all familiar with here. In, uh, in Calgary, so I don't have to explain to you what a mountain is, as I sometimes do, for example, in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true, this site was intensely problematic. Uh, you might have looked at it and said, boy, that's really a bunch of crap. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, as hard as everything is to make this work, we have to find great uh, invention in solving like, uh, the challenges here. And it's that invention that makes this project really wonderful. If this site didn't have a train running through it, if it, that train wasn't running on a curve, if it wasn't in this particular location and located next to these village where we needed to bring people through it, it might have just been another square building. You know? We could at least say, well, oh, it's got to be curved because the train tracks are curved and everyone would say, okay, Otherwise, they'd say, no, you have to straighten it out. It's not easy. <laughs> so um, it allowed us to rethink uh, the siding of the building. Uh, many of our original sketches showed ways in which people could pass through. We recognized very quickly that the profound character of this library and its meaning to the city required a presence more than just being behind some kind of massive commercial building. It needed to have its, its prominence. Uh, in, the, in the city context. So we worked to find new places for the commercial uh, facilities. We reformatted the site and gave it a private place to the library as it reaches out towards 7th and the, runs its, its uh, facade continually along the third. So uh, as was shown <coughs> earlier by our, our friends from Stuart Olson, a magnificent piece of work to cover over the train line, which is a beautiful structure in and of itself. For those of you perhaps know some great um, contemporary artists like Richard Serra or others. This could have just been a magnificent work of art and if you would have left it alone and everybody would have said, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we, we tried to incorporate it into the scale of the building and you begin to see now as you look down on the site how the building will, will um, present itself through a unique uh, geometry uh, that is porous and acceptable uh, to people walking by. Uh, we also have, as uh, was mentioned earlier, took great pride in the design of the facade. Uh, one thing that wasn't mentioned was that this prototype, which was built solely for the purpose of testing all the various details. <laughs> This prototype was built, and you will not guess where, it's actually in my, was built in Miami, because as you know from the weather today, what better place to test Calgarian weather? <laughs> so uh, it stood there in Miami for a long time, and people would say, oh, that's up in Canada. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's actually works well. They have systems to test it in different ways, even though it's in a different climate. And it was a beautiful thing to see, and when you get up close, you can begin to see, you know, there are many panels on this facade. It's not just glass and metal. There, glass is treated in different ways, and then it's treated in different ways. So when you look at it, like you see here, just in this one tiny little shot of the prototype, the sky presents itself in different ways. You see new reflections, and it should be very artistic uh, as an expression. And it's all relying on natural light. 
Um, this picture was taken not too long ago, and I really love it because um, a library is about connecting things, uh, as uh, we learned earlier today. And I think nobody knows that one in the construction crew here laying the conduit uh, uh, underneath the slabs. I love the way these, these little, little conduit are just laid out there. I wish we could just um, have known where they were and made the floor pattern showing where these conduits were. But people know of the enormous technology and skill that goes in to making a building like this. Well, one of the things we said very early on was, what is a library, really? I mean, if I ask all of you to imagine in your head what a library looks like, I, I don't think you'd imagine this building, first of all, but you will, I mean, inside you would, but the exterior of it doesn't present itself as a library. We don't really know what a library is or looks like, but one thing we do know, and this was, I said rather eloquently by Joel earlier, is it's really not a resource, it's a place. Uh, it's not about just giving you things, or being a shop, or having a commodity. It's about being somewhere, and being somewhere there in a very profound and important way. Uh, libraries were never really about books. Uh, they were never really about computers. They've always been about the bridge between these technologies and our intellect. And so libraries are first and foremost about people, because a book, without someone reading it, is not a book. It's just some paper. Uh, unless someone interacts with the book, its value is never fulfilled. And the same is true with computers and any other kind of technology you imagine. So we always must put people at the forefront of our thinking of what a library is. Uh, this is a great painting by Raphael uh, called The School of Athens, uh, which was, a, a, in a way, a type of library of, the, of, of, of antiquity. Um, there's Socrates and Plato in the middle. And, one of the things I love about this, this image, this beautiful painting, it's in the Vatican, by the way, some of you may have seen it. It's just a wondrous aspirational character of the room, all the details. And even if you look at the coffers up there in the ceiling, you might look at the facade of our building and think a little bit about those coffers, the airiness of it. Uh, but most importantly, the craziness of this space. I mean, there are people just doing everything, everywhere. <laughs> There's men, there's women, there's young, there's old, there's just everybody doing everything. That's what the library really is, and they knew that in antiquity. Uh, and, and our mythological understanding of libraries was all about this. It wasn't just about providing books. And we, we know that, and we know that by the care that librarians take in providing a service for us. So when you see the new building, you see this large space, this atrium filled with natural light and the shapes of the columns, uh, some of the spaces that you'll experience. Hopefully you'll think back to these great libraries of antiquity uh, that inspired so much of our civilization that we have today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a modern architect, and my company works with modern architecture, but it would be wrong to suggest that just because we're interested in modernism, we're ignorant of the past. And I think the past has made a profound uh, influence on how we imagine, especially libraries. Um, and these curving forms lead your eye to different rooms. There's lots and lots of different types of spaces for you to enjoy. Uh, so I thought to put these two together uh, somehow to suggest uh, that this isn't just about making a library in Calgary. It's about participating in a story that goes back thousands of years. And we, we should feel that when we're there. Um, great stoas of the past, these ancient Greek form type buildings that you move through. Uh, where Plato or Socrates might have talked about uh, the characteristics of existence and moved through these spaces. By the way, these were also crazy spaces when they were built. They, you could drink beer there, you could have wine, and you could talk about the meaning of life. Yeah, <laughs> um, so here you can see uh, a kind of context of, of the new space. It's also a linear building. It has, if I might go back, uh, linear qualities such as this. And, and interpret it in a contemporary way that has meaning to people today rather than trying to recreate exactly what we saw in places of the past. And then you can see the children's uh, center down there. This, by the way, is the view that we saw um, from the site that as they have now created a platform where the cafe and children's and library areas might be. But as you look out the window, this is even on the lower, lowest level of the raised portions of the library, you get fantastic views. Uh, of the city. Uh, and looking back from the cafe, down the ramping space that leads you in 
to the collections that are most uh, uh, near, nearest to the entry, um, some of the more dynamic spaces of the library, uh, the children's library and an earlier rendering, uh, right adjacent to, uh, and near to the cafe and some of the other mediums as early study, uh, looking out across the city and the landscape of Calgary. And the landscape of Calgary has, of course, always been important to us. It's a rather magnificent landscape that transforms from this kind of massive flatness to an incredible verticality. I mean, it basically goes from, you know, flat to vertical in 60 seconds or less. And, uh, you know, you just don't see that anywhere. And, of course, the ice and the snow that um, never actually comes here, but, um, you know, we like it. Uh, it has these wonderful patterns that uh, are really, truly beautiful, uh, nature's uh, works of art. And the, the, this amazing pattern of the Chinook Arch uh, that occurs here. Every time some of our staff are out here and there's one of these things occur, they take a lot of pictures of it. And in fact, we posted one on our website because uh, uh, Dennis was out here the other day and there was one of these arches appeared in the sky. So. We put it in our newsletter too, so everyone all over the world saw this Chinook Arch in Calgary that is going right across the site. We were inspired by uh, the um, uh, arts and the, the, the works of, of uh, the people that lived here long before um, we arrived. Uh, you know, the, the, nation, the, the nations uh, that um, created um, great civilizations here, and so you'll you kind of remember or, or see bits of that in, in the facade. Or you might see something like that in, in, in this image, which is sort of like a collection of a village all coming together. Or you might see a snowflake or something else. It's, it's a kind of an association game, actually. And different people will have their own way of saying what they think it is. Uh, and in the distance, as you approach it, uh, this is, of course, looking north, you'll be able to see the wood rising up over the passage connecting to the East Village and a grove of trees. Uh, but this is a, a, a view, more or less, if I'll go back, there you can see uh, a, a ramp to your right leading up to the archway. And this is taken from the bottom of that ramp today. I can tell you, it is truly amazing to be on that ramp. I'll just step over here because, you know, we're so used to walking on everything flat, except for Bill, who jumps all over the place. <laughs> But, uh, um, you know, when you're on something like this, you really feel it. I mean, you really do. And, and I, it was a very powerful uh, setting today uh, to walk on that ramp. Um, looking back uh, toward the building from East Village, uh, the light of the entry, the reading rooms exposing themselves, the warm wood inviting me in uh, through the passage. Um, but I wanted to mention the trees um, very quickly. We're very near the end. Um, Libraries of, the, of antiquity were actually centered often around groves of trees. And there's something rather wonderful about this idea that um, we could be outside, we can enjoy nature, and these trees are, are somehow um, significant in our understanding of knowledge. Uh, they're symbolic of knowledge. And this is Plato's uh, um, Academy, or actually Lyceum uh, in Athens. And you can see the olive tree in the background. We have trees in this building. We're very lucky that we have landscape space. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the birch tree is an interesting tree because it's the first tree to see a place that has been um, damaged. So um, if there's a clearing where, say, someone removed trees or something else happened to flood, birch tree will be the first to show itself. And these types of trees and their ancestors' ash and otherwise are, 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 are trees that we find interesting. Um, the, the space there that you just saw, uh, which is the area now where those trees were that you just saw, is still a construction site that we're beginning to see how that space would feel. Looking down from above to where the great auditorium, the new auditorium will be, uh, an auditorium where you don't have to go through the detail, you can really well live, um, and uh, you have a great space for um, for it. I'm putting things up and enjoying different uh, types of festivities or with speeches to performances. This is a view into that auditorium space as it exists today. Uh, this is a wonderful little moment that uh, there's a little column that's been tested and Stuart Olson is doing a great job along with their contractors to make amazing concrete work. We've been talking about it in our studio a lot. This little column is like a test for some of the exposed columns and uh, as we were talking today, it's so smooth and so so well made, this column, 
uh, that it was referred to, at least by me, as having the, perhaps the feeling of a baby's body. So I'm certain that people will go up to this column and just kind of uh, It is interestingly made of, as we were told, uh, um, of slag, which is uh, industrial waste from the steel production process that's been put into the admixture to make this column more white than it might otherwise be. I'll conclude by saying uh, that in the end, all of this, uh, to me anyway, goes back to this little image, um, the humble oil lamp. And this is where it all began, uh, this way of, of shining the light in the darkness, uh, a way of um, showing us a path forward when it seems like there may be no path forward. Libraries play that role, uh, and they were, they were created around very simple facilities. And I think what I hope for is that this facility, although it's fairly uh, large and, and has a lot of activity in it, it will still remain simple, true to its nature, as a kind of light in the dark, uh, a way to um, see forward into the future, a way to create new ideas, imagine new things, create things on our own. We don't have li this library just to take things away from it. We're going to make things in this library. We're going to make new things in this library things that we can't even imagine, and uh, that is the hope, so that we, we can, at least in some way, return to the joy that existed when people first had the idea to build this in this uh, very interesting city. So, thank you very much. I actually, my aunt is from Calgary, um, and so I have family that I'm looking to in this very, really very distant family, but my aunt is from Calgary, so if you ever see a woman walking down the street, or, or there's a woman whose last name is Dykers, this is a very uncommon name. So I'm sure that it'll be her. Iris Dykers is her name. And you can ask, stop her in the street and ask her for embarrassing stories. <laughs> 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 who have uh, microphones, and uh, so if you just simply raise your hand, uh, Jack and Brynn will bring the microphone to you. So we're going to open it up for, for conversations, but I, I thought I'd pick on Mike, because Mike has been sitting there for the last two hours, I think, and, um, uh, and so while Craig catches his breath and, and the other panelists do the same, I thought I'd start with Mike and maybe ask some questions related to if you don't, if, if you're not familiar with our present CEO, he obviously works in the East Village project. But before this, he was involved with a little project called the Bowes Tower, and now the new Central Library. So my question for Mike is, um, Mike, in your opinion, what uh, what's the most important criterion for the delivery of a successful project? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you mic'd up? I don't want to not speak it, Tom. So at least I'm working. So. Um, nice thing, Susan, give me a heads up on the question, because uh, it is a very important question. Um, and, you know, the most important thing, is it all centers around vision. Um, and it centers around the commitment to a common vision. But the nuance is, is identifying that vision that's not necessarily currently within you or within you know, somebody else, but pulling the right folks together to generate that vision. Uh, and then holding everyone accountable to um, it. And it's with that, you know, when you have such a great vision, it's such an important 
project, uh, there's a certain responsibility. And it's really important that you know, there's an alignment. And, and just as an anecdote, um, every month I get to go meet with uh, uh, Councilor Farrell, who she holds me accountable to the vision. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, uh, allows these projects or any project to be successful. Is that real strong? Questions from the audience? Anybody? Oh, okay, right here in the room. It's 150,000 square feet. How does that compare to the existing library? And how environmentally friendly is the new building? Is it need certified or what features? So, you want to see the flat one, Bill? The building we're in right now, I'd say about 167,000 square feet. The new building is 240,000 square feet. But you know, there's a big difference. Um, when you've got a building on six floors, you really don't have as much building as that. And so when we have fewer floors, wider spaces, in a way, there's going to be much, much more library if you're just adding up the square feet. It's going to be more significant. Going to be, it's great flexibility and, and give us the opportunity to do things we can never think about doing here in this current building. So I, I think that it's a bit of apples and oranges, but just for the numbers, uh, you know, we've got that pretty significant increase in this place. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. <coughs> Jack, do you have something? Okay. Yes, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. Uh, that vision that you referred to, is it uh, framed within a budget? And uh, how are we doing budget-wise? Uh, it's a good question. So that, uh, first off, the vision does include budget. It always does. Uh, vision is uh, an illustration of what success looks like. That, that's what it means to me. Now, how are we doing? We're not going to the park. We're exactly where we want to be. Maybe it's a little better in terms of budget and in terms of schedule. Um, obviously, we're doing great time-wise because we start asking about can we go faster. Uh, so I think uh, the budget is a big part of it, and it's you know vision is. We oftentimes look vision and look at it and say it's a picture, and we say okay, it's a, it's you know it's a rendering. It's a, a, a really strong vision is one that is really you illustrate what success is, and you get alignment around success and with that budget. And part of that process is there's been, uh, as everyone has touched on, but there's an enormous amount of work on, on the front end, what we call pre-construction uh, as well as the design phase. But that has involved a, an image, which is something that all of us want to deliver. But as Mike said, that vision does include the budget. So there's a lot of work that goes into every detail of that vision, right down to the wood floors, um, the, type of, the type of materials that are used. <laughs> And we work together and have a back and forth dialogue as to what fits that vision as well as what fits the budget. By the way, I, I would say that your your comment anyway at least implies that we're not overspending. But you also need to think the other problem, underspending. You don't want a project that underspends. So if you want a project that spends exactly the right amount of money. Um, and that, that can happen. You can be in a process where things get taken out and suddenly you realize too much out. Uh, that's a problem too. It's a, it, as bad of a problem as overspending. So in this particular case, I really work together to make sure the right amount uh, um, meets the right targets, so you get the right building. What is the tool for the architectural team, for the construction team to engage uh, the library and the city? Um, just to spend a lot of time uh, making sure they understood what. What are the characteristics of the library? What does it need to do? What kind of a thing or a car? Does it need to have a V8 or does it need to have a V6? Does it need to have a corridor or does it need to do a It went through all that process. Then went through a process of saying, okay, what the appropriate budget is there? And then went out and the team around. So that it allows to make sure you're, you're hitting the mark. And I agree with what Craig's saying because it's not uh, in Calgary, we have uh, some examples of buildings that you know, we can successfully say, yeah, it's under budget. Um, but I would say it's probably didn't keep the mark in terms of being on the functional side of the meeting. There's a part of the budget, I could just add something, Susan. There's a part of the budget that you don't see. There's something 
that's not there. And I'll tell you what it is from the library's perspective. I've been involved with libraries that have taken on as big mm -hmm. projects, I mean, collectively, you know. It is so consuming of the organization. So during the time this library has been designed and is now being constructed, the Calgary Public Library has done amazing things. I mean, you've heard, you've heard about some of the things. But our staff are just doing wonderful things. We've got, we visited every licensed daycare in the city of Calgary last year, and we're doing that again this year. We couldn't do that if we were spending all of our time and attention to managing this project. I know that from experience. So I think there's another benefit, you know, and it's the project and it's the things that Kate talked about that have given amazing value to the community. Super, yes, we have interested in hearing I was interested in hearing a little more about the dependencies of the schedule. the dependencies of the schedule of the schedule and um, um, you mentioned briefly about wanting to speak out of that. I just wanted to propose that we can you know, get into the building of the organization and uh, soft landscaping because I can't wait to see it. Drew has given us our marching orders. So. It's the same with the budget, though. You don't want to finish a wine before it's time. <laughs> and the how and talking a lot with Stuart Olson and how to figure it out. I think that this building is interesting and Carson touched on it a little bit, but the, the underbelly, we call it, which sounds actually yeah, we pretty dirty, better, um, yeah. but it's not. It's a really beautiful archway, let's call it. Like, we refer to it as the underbelly, unfortunately, but it's a walkway that you walk through. It's kind of tied into the whole schedule of everything. But we are looking at priorities in terms of why, what would happen if we got it what would that look like and how can we do it? I think, uh, who knows, at this stage, we're, we're, as Mike said, we're really set up, we're doing really well, knock on some wood somewhere. Um, it's, it's going really well, and there's there's a lot of sequential tasks, but we actually are gaining some time, so we'll see, I guess, to be determined. But we hear you. <laughs> and, and our main focus is to at least uh, ensure that we hit our baseline target. So our first and foremost goal is to make sure not only do we deliver the project on time, and, and as Mike has pointed out, uh, on or under budget, um, but are also our other priorities to make sure that the building at the end of the day for the Calgary Public Library and the citizens of Calgary is delivered to the expectations that we've seen here today, to the expectations of, of the architecture and the design that has gone into the building. So our, our initial goals and what's most important is that we meet all of those expectations um, and then, and then from there, we we love to improve absolutely. Okay, Brent, you have somebody there. Hi. Hi. You commented briefly on the visioning process, and I was just wondering if you could elaborate on the opportunities that were existing for public participation in the project. We had, um, <clears throat> I think I mentioned in my presentation that. Um, Actually, before I was here, there was a very, very significant uh, public engagement. Uh, there were, um, all told, we had about 20,000 people, which is, I think, one of the biggest civic engagement uh, efforts in the city of Calgary. I know that one of the things that we did is a follow-up to that initial, and there were, I think, about 12,000 people that participated initially. Uh, we went back to another engagement. We actually got a graphic facilitator. And it was online and everything else, but we also went to every part of the city. And we didn't just go to places where people couldn't get to or nobody wants to go to. We went to shopping centers. We, whatever was a, a gathering place for people uh, throughout the city, we were there and we'd spend Saturdays and evenings and at times when people could really access it. So we really worked hard to make sure that we understood. And it was really interesting. It was one of the things that I think is fueling what we're trying to do and get ready, getting ready for this building is from that engagement by hearing, you know, uh, from people who found Shaughnessy, for instance, what is it that's going to make you take your family, put them on the train, or drive down here and come to the library? Uh, you know, we understand that we've got to be challenged. And, uh, and it was that engagement process that gave us that kind of information. It also, at the same time, from our perspective, informed the design. So that as we thought about the children's area, we didn't want just a 
a, a kind of a, a children's area that was built beautifully, but it, but you know, frankly, once you've been to it, you've seen it. And he actually went and studied children's museums and things like that. He found that it needs to be actually be simple. It needs to incorporate play. It needs to do all sorts of things. It needs to be flexible. It needs to grow and evolve over time. Again, that came about from the engagement process. This is for Craig. Um, on the practical side, how did you address the noise and vibration uh, of the track relative to the building? And second, uh, um, from the architectural standpoint, how did that influence your decision other than the actual tracks happening there before you started? Sure. Well, we know that Calgarians are very loud, so we just thought this would be a problem to you know, drown out the noise of the trains. But just in case, we decided we'd better um, place the uh, the train uh, tunnel within a sort of box in the box, uh, separating structure. So actually, the two things never truly meet. Um, so you won't really be aware of the train. I have to say that very early on, we thought that maybe wasn't such a good idea. We thought, wouldn't it be interesting if maybe there was some place where you could really maybe see the train or experience it? But we found that it was too impactful on the use of the library, even if, even if it's an interesting idea. Um, did ever, so, yeah? Did you ever uh, consider talking to the CT and have the uh, tracks about the late or uh, vibration? No, we, 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 I think, know from experience, you can't get the train people to change anything, so <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't fight that, that battle, although we have in the past. Um, no, it's primarily just a basic structural system that we built out, and, and it, it didn't really impact the building in any direct way, but I will say, as I mentioned in my talk, the curving line of the train and the ramping line of the tracks actually made the, the form of the building, so those curves, which are actually quite beautiful, um, are really projections of the train line straight up. So some architects would have said, well, let's just pretend like it doesn't exist and we'll, we'll cover it over. But then you'd have all these structural gymnastics that would be very, very difficult to manage. So by following the tracks, easily uh, containing the acoustics within a double box system, uh, we, I think, made more efficient design. One more thing, we're not on. Uh, Mike, but um, what about geothermal heating and air, air conditioning? Well, you know, it is possible, but um, we have a pretty good system in place. I think the, the building has a, a, a relatively uh, efficient use of natural light and other things so that we, we actually reduce impact of energy costs. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty tight building, too. Um, we get good daylight where we need it. Um, but we didn't go into too many bells and whistles. Yeah. Uh, for the whole building. So we actually don't have a gas line running through the building. We're using all of our um, heating pumps running through the steam. Another thing we hope all the stairs and the ramps will be interesting to people. Um, the elevators are nice too for those who have to use elevators, but we're hoping you know people will be very active in the building. I think Brendan has something here. Uh, I really like the understanding um, that knowledge develops through building upon other people's ideas and the conversations that have come from them. And um, building some great examples of this because buildings take a lot of people to realize like the point that it's made. And so with this being said, um, uh, whether it's from a business perspective, um, whether it's from a building perspective or an architectural perspective, um, what conversation do you have with the existing library design? And how is that sort of integrated into the process of building a new one? So you're asking what we use or what we rely upon for current contemporary library construction to influence this building. Exactly. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, <clears throat> and I'm going to be doing a TED talk later this or next month, and, and um, it's about the future of libraries. And, one, and I actually did an article about that. 
I don't think anybody really, really knows. And I think that anything that we would look at right now, I would be suspicious of, because libraries is kind of quite a to. They're involved in, they're really more dependent upon the people that are using the library rather than what the library thinks it ought to be. So I think that, you know, to go back, I mean, I can give you examples of looking at the Seattle's downtown library or any of the major North American libraries, you know, for downtown areas. Um, one thing we did find, though, many of those libraries have difficulty uh, in terms of translating what they want to do and the urban situation they find themselves in. That's something that's been topmost in our mind. It's actually a lot of what we're trying to do here currently to learn how to deal with those kinds of things and bring people into the creating environment that you know has the kind of Raphael painting kind of like the, the, the situation that we're looking for. So again, you know, we, we, we studied, we, we you know looked at, but a lot of libraries, you know, that, that have gone before us, if you will, are really reflections of those places and those people. So I think it was more important to engage in this civic, you know, this 20,000 people and really understand what was important here in Calgary and then what the library could do. So ultimately, it is a very flexible space. It is a very, it is going to evolve. And one of the great things, I kind of alluded to it, our foundation is doing a great job of creating the support that will allow this building and this library system to continue that evolution because it isn't static. It doesn't, it's not a building that forevermore will look like this. Maybe you could have thought that way 100 years ago, but not anymore. And so the real goal of the library is to remain relevant to the lives of the people it serves. This building needs to help us accomplish that. Thank you. Thank you. Library goes back. And for others in the room, there's there's studies and studies and studies looking at this building and looking at in terms of how it can be either you know, redone, torn down, and they, it was always focused on, on many times the library looking at this site. Um, and I think one of the things that really a turning point because if you think about this project, this is you mean the site that the, the current existing site, the current existing site. Sorry, my apologies. The, the idea of replacing this building is it's been around for a number of years. Um, I think the turning point was, what, as, as Bill had talked to, is when you got into the engagement with Calgarians and start asking the question, what do you want to see? And that, at the end of the day, day was the point. It, 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 it's almost, you can see it. It was like a, a switch, a light switch. And it's when the momentum started moving ahead, in terms of which allowed you know, to get the budget in place to move forward with this project, to hire the right teams, to get the social license to even execute this type of vision in these type of building. And it was, but it was at that point in time when the community was engaged that really turned out. Librarians are very innovative, too. I mean, they're the most innovative people I know of. If you don't know any librarians, get to know them because they're really cool. <laughs> Thanks. Carson spoke to this, but I'm happy to hear from any of you. Um, you spoke of the greater collaboration of this team than with other teams, partly because it's a one of kind building, partly because of the challenge of the tracks. Was there anything done on a contractual or project management um, uh, uh, perspective to be able to handle the risks um, and, and properly distribute the risks and the benefits of the unique building and the MRT tracks? Definitely. Um, in addition to uh, a few curling sessions where not everyone was hurt, uh, there, was, uh, yeah, there was some blood. There was blood. Oh, God. First time curling. Big dash. She's no longer here. <laughs> 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 failed the curling test. <laughs> 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 it was no curling test. So. Um, so we did a lot of, you know, at the base level, a lot of team building. I think it's interesting for this project. And when we were looking for the team, it's a five-year project. It's kind of a marriage in sight, in sight, right? We all have to work together. We're not going to all get along. I mean, we've all had moments, and we're all still sitting here. We have big, huge moments. But you have to get through them. Like, I mean, Cal in Calgary at the moment. A moment. moment. Yeah, because like in New York, <laughs> this would be considered a nice city. Yeah. Um, so we all we know we have to get to get along for five years. And, but your question is, you know, contractually, have we dealt, dealt with the risks? 
I think uh, the CMLC in this relationship, as I showed kind of the graph, um, the city has given $175 million to the project. CMLC has committed to putting $70 million in. We, uh, CMLC bears the risk of it, it going over, a, do a dollar over it's on us to, to pay. Um, and so, as such, we need to manage that risk. And um, some of the ways we've done that is make sure that we're doing the right contracts with each of the different consultants that we're working with. We only hold the contract with Stuart Olson and for prime design consultants, and then all those other people on the picture are, con are contractually obligated up upwards. So, um, I think a lot of it is, um, you know, on, on the legal side of things, it's contracts, but I'd say on the relationship side of things, that five-year commitment, and, and we, we invest in it in, in you know, a weird way to say that, but we spend a lot of time together, we communicate a lot, and uh, I think that helps uh, helps smooth the road. Uh, for all the time. You know what I got it? So I, I was very fortunate that I worked on the mobile link. Uh, if anybody's here at Berkeley Mogo, forgive me for what I'm going to say. One of the elements that we worked in for a project team was uh, elevating uh, negativity, and it became about, it wasn't about how good I am, it's about how bad you are. And one of the things that we started with project team, um, uh, we started from a point of uh, there was some, uh, I believe, animosity was too strong term, there was some tension that existed between you know, the city. And, and the library between ourselves. And there became a point where I would I would honestly say, one, uh, the folks involved did accept it um, and were committed to do something far greater. Um, and if you maintain and you continue to be negative, you weren't part of the team. Uh, and we mean that those just, uh, we didn't make those decisions, but the system kind of self-identifies and makes those decisions. Uh, and then our job as leaders is to basically ensure that, that we're always committed to a greater vision. Uh, and I can tell you that one of the benefits, as I've said, of working on a project that didn't have that is you know when it starts kicking in. And when it does start kicking in, you call it up right away. And because what kills a project at the end of the day uh, is a negativity, but really kills it is the fact that you can't collaborate on solutions to very difficult problems because you're not working as a team. I wanted to say also that um, one of the things we said during the selection process was that a great concept for an architectural work can withstand a great deal of change without losing its character. So I feel that the building changed a lot. I mean, a whole lot. You wouldn't see it. I mean, I'd have to. You have to really look carefully to see, but it was actually huge. <laughs> so I think that that's also a way of seeing the, the process, trying to find a, an architecture that allows change. Because as Bill said, it's going to have to do that anyway after it's built. So why shouldn't it do it while it's being designed? Thank you. 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 Um, I'm just curious to hear about some of the feedback and engagement in terms of um, programming activities that are going to be put in place at the, at the library. I think there was an overwhelming, yes, we have to do it. <laughs> um, I guess that's a question for me. A couple of things about that. Um, technology. How do we incorporate technology? You heard a lot about that. Uh, we also, how can we create a, a, a library that different people, different age groups will feel comfortable in. Uh, we heard a lot about that. There, Calgary is an amazing young community. 83,000 kids <laughs> under the age of five. How can families participate in this? We heard a lot about that. And uh, what, how can this be special so that everybody in Calgary can feel that, that, that they're going to be able to participate in it with their family and not just as individuals. So those were some of the things that come to mind. You know, again, as I mentioned in the presentation, they wanted more of everything. One of the things, we just had a woman, uh, Gemma John, who is uh, at a Winston Churchill Scholarship from England, who is a big uh, picture firm, and she's doing a study of libraries around the world. And one of the things that she observed, we asked her, we did a debrief with her, she said that one of the things in many of the significant libraries that she's visited, that was lacking with a number of spaces, community spaces, 
As I mentioned, you have 42 local spaces in this facility. And I don't know if it was intended to that for that, or maybe everybody wanted their own bookable space. But in any case, we've got a building that has an incredible amount of space in which community can come together. And as she reported on going around the world to most significant libraries, that was the one thing that a lot of libraries wish that they had included more of than they did. So. Mm -hmm. Um, just building on that question, though, Bill, perhaps you can talk about, as, as you and I have talked about, how do you build community now in an emerging community? Because your team is already thinking through how they want to participate in the community, and yet there's not a library built. So maybe you could chat about that. Well, again, you know, one of the things we, we decided is let's use what we have right now as, as, a, as a lab. You know, so a lot of the, I mentioned before, a lot of the concepts uh, we're in the process of putting together what we call an ideal lab, which will be like a space in the New Central Library, where people will be have access to technology and they'll be able to, I call it, brainstorm within the space. It's different than a meeting that has got more technology. Mm -hmm. We're going to learn how to do that. One of the things we've learned already in that process is we don't do it. it you know, Craig was very nice to say librarians are, you know, amazing people, and we are. But you know, one thing, that, <laughs> especially when it comes to technology, we bring in people. There's so many groups in this community, you know, that and so many folks who have really good ideas about how technology can be brought to bear, how to use open data, uh, how to use, you know, the data sets that governments, you know, generate, but nobody is able to use those kinds of things. We're thinking about how that can happen here, but we're thinking about how we can get our community partners to make that come alive in this space so we can transfer that over to the new space. What is it? When I think of Canada, I think of a world in which we have safe, with uh, clean air and clean water. How do you see water representing in the building? Sure, well, we, we capture, we have rain in the gardens. Some of those landscape features that you saw help control um, water on the side. Um, there's uh, a, a way, I think, of experiencing nature through, through, through the windows of the building and they'll, they'll be aware of the different weather conditions. And we don't have any water features per se. I, mean, I think for us anyway it would be counterproductive to try to show the beauty of nature by artificially recreating it using a water feature. So we shy away from that. But the rain gardens and all those all those little terraces outside, I think they'll be beautiful reminders of the the value of, of um, soil, earth, and, um, and water um, as you enter the building. To, to add to that, Craig, um, one of the unique pieces that was also um, a large consideration, especially when it comes to water, is we have three different cisterns, all of which are kept under, under the grade or under the base level of the site. And all of those cisterns capture all of the rainwater, all of the different water that uh, the site experiences, and that water is then used um, for the landscaping, for the green spaces. And so all of the the agriculture or the green spaces is all <laughs> watered by using that collected water. So it's not using potable water off the grid, so to speak. Nobody's asked about parking. Knowing how the population is aging, how is the library aging? So I uh, also to start that day, we already have a, actually a very large uh, seniors population in this village, which is great. And so they were actually kind of wanting to the design this room as we were uh, talking about priorities for the site. Uh, one of the things that you have with the train that buys next to the site is we have to get open <coughs> to get it in front of the door. So to that end, I believe our right hand over yeah, and it's, so it's below the slope. It's, it's, it's not actually technically ran. Yeah, it's technically not a way. It's a piece of wood. So there are, there are um, <laughs> for accessibility, and on the east side of the site, there's actually an elevator that, that brings people up. And that's just speaking about the mobility, and the ramping that occurs within the building is also really important. I don't know if you're talking well, I would have said young people is the other side of that coin. You know, libraries have gone through a period of, of, of history where younger people, young adults, 
didn't feel the need to go to the library to go and help. And it was too um, sort of frightening of an institution for them to walk into. And I think libraries today are more inviting for, for younger people. And you know, some of them may just show up from, from not knowing why, except, wow, this is really cool. You know, no other reason other than that, once they're in. And they start to discover all the other things they can do in the library. So um, it's important that we, we recognize changes in, in youth sensibilities. As, as well as for the future, um, through the design process, the design that is meant for a building that lasts an extremely long time, at a minimum of 100 years, uh, which is above your, your normal average in, in new construction. So the design, as well as the materials we're using and how we're building the library, is built truly to last, as well as built to be flexible in the future. When the library needs to change 5, 10, 20, 30 years from now, the building is adaptable to that. By the way, if there are any younger people out there, when I said the word cool, they probably cringed. It's like boots or somebody. I don't know if this is an appropriate question it's because we're, we're discussing uh, the monumental building, and I sense that we're spending a lot of dollars in this building. Are we going, because of that, are we going to sacrifice the internal contents, such as the knowledge base, the books, etc.? Uh, is there going to be pushback because of the dollars spent on the building? Yeah, I, um, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, we're trying to, to that's why I mentioned we're trying now to figure out how to do it better. Which is, uh, um, one of the things about this great work with the city of Calgary is that they have anticipated. Uh, you know, again, we have budget processes to go through and everything else, but it, this has been contemplated. What will be the operational increases necessary to make sure that this building functions well? It would be crazy to have this building rebuilt and, and, and open and not be able to appropriately run it. And so we're not talking about running it in the same level as this building. We're talking about this is such an important building, it needs to be open more. It needs to do more things. And so, you know, but I will say, on the other side of the hand, I think it's a more efficient building. As I mentioned, the six floors alone cause, and that's the most expensive thing that you can do to a building as far as staffing and the long-term operation. It costs $20,000 a day to operate this building right now. I think we can do that in the new building. I think we can do better than that, as a matter of fact. As far as the content is concerned, we've been working on our collections, and there's been some real shifts. For instance, there aren't as many DVDs and CDs and things available now as there used to be, and, and, and frankly, the, the, the demand for that, you know, it, it is changing. Uh, so there's more digital content. Reference books are another great example. When I started working in libraries, reference took up half from the floor and everything else. Well, you can't buy physical reference books anymore. It's all digital. It's probably much better and more accurate information, more up-to-date information. So we're incorporating those things, but the collection continues to be an important focus. One of the things I'm so proud of is this new thing that we're doing. You can see in any one of our libraries, it's something called We Recommend. Rather than have new books out or the usual thing, our staff are actually thinking about the, some of the four uh, attributes, plot, people, places, and prose, and actually organizing our collections that way, in a way they're demonstrating their knowledge so that people can come into a library and experience that knowledge in the things that they'll see. The collections continue to be an important part of what a library does. It's our core business in many ways, it, it, but you, it's the half of the equation. You connect the people to the content. You've got to have good content, but you've got to have good connections. I want to say it very quickly. Um, you mentioned that it's a monument. There are many kinds of monuments. There are sculptural monuments that people seem to think are like super expensive and all they do is look weird. Uh, and, uh, and then there are social monuments. I think this building is a social monument. People will remember what they what happened to them there. They will go there as children and they will remember as they are adults something that they experienced there. That's a social monument. Now money, whatever you may think of it, is essentially a pile of paper. It's an abstraction unless you use it properly. We can discuss how we use it. But I would ask you, if you have some money, what would you rather spend it on? Is this worth spending money on? Are we getting value back? And how long will that value last 
beyond the quantity of the money that was spent on it. So for me, I, I look at money as something that needs to be used, and it needs to be used properly. Here, uh, and thank you. These are great questions. So, Jack, I'll leave it to you there. Hi, uh, perhaps a unpopular question, but it's not about parking. Um, <laughs> I was wondering because one of the larger user groups that never gets talked about is people that really have nowhere else to go. Um, that people have, you know, the only place that feels safe is a central library they can go to. I was wondering if you can touch upon perhaps there's some sort of program or space that's dedicated to this problem to reduce the fact. Okay, well, I mean, again, we understand one of the great things about working in libraries is that you have a commitment to serve everyone. And once you do that, you know, you open yourself up to dealing with everyone, okay? And, uh, and so that has its challenges. Somebody once said, a very wise person uh, who looked at libraries, you know, and been in libraries, said, it's an amazing institution in which people from all ages and walks of life come together and have to operate in a very civil way. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of for us the, uh, the, the overriding principle. How do we get people to everybody, you know, to all companies we talked about, but to act in a, in a civil manner? There are many ways to do this. We've been trying to learn in this building how to deal with all that stuff. And, and one of the things that we keep coming back to, aside from security things and, you know, surveillance or whatever, and we're learning the more important thing is how do you bring a critical mass of people into the building, which means it's back on us. And how do we do things like tonight, or like, as I mentioned, the Hatchers Brain Institute, or the children's programs, or other things that we're going to do in, this, in the lobby of the, of the library upstairs? Uh, how do we do things that will bring so many people here that the norm becomes a community wide norm as opposed to a norm that's just from a, a, a segment of the population? And that's really what we're learning and what we're trying to do with uh, how to do that. Um, just to build on that, is that this this is also an interesting building that it is public. I mean, there are a lot of really interesting architectural buildings that are all over the world that you cannot get into if you go to swipe for them. Um, you know, the bowl being one of them, you have to be toured up again if you're lucky enough to get in. But this is, this is a, the, the flip side of having this architectural um, piece in our building, in our city, is that we all can go there. And I think that's a pretty good problem. Second last question. What was the process for naming the new Central Library and is that the final name? <laughs> 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 it's going to be called Gene. <laughs> <laughs> the new Central Library, oh, yeah, I maybe I can answer the question because I was responsible for the um, It's a project name. It references a project only and it's not intended to be the final name given to the, <laughs> the project. It's simply a reference of the project. I, I can say for uh, behalf of our foundation that naming rights are their own. So, we had some great community leaders who already stepped forward and done that. I mentioned Judith on that because in the audience today, and the, uh, the old Boy Hill Library is now the Judith on the beautiful new Judith on that library. And, uh, Thanks for her generosity. So, I mean, I think that that's the kind of thing that we're doing. And again, this is a fully funded project, but that, those resources that will come in will enable the library to continue to allow and grow. So, you know, your question is actually very, very important. It means, is this, this building and the rest of the library system worth investing in? And we think it is. And we think it's investing in the legacy and the long term vibrancy of the city of California. So this is the real second last question. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. So, so it seems that um, well, I would like to speak to the, the topic of parking, but um, the question well, I, I would ask is, <laughs> um, could you describe, I guess, the thought process behind the design of uh, access to the facility? You talked about accessibility um, for people, I guess, potentially uh, who need, you know, the different kinds of ramps, but accessibility in terms of, you know, bikes, walking, um, cars, public transit. And some of it is obviously designed into it, so there's parking spaces for bicycles and other things. There's the ease of using the ramps to get the bicycles in and around the site. Um, you know, there's a, a adjacencies of public transportation systems that are widely used. Um, there's a newly designed um, third, uh, well, at least let's just say the third would be more accessible pedestrians. 
just because of its quality than it has been in the past. <laughs> um, and there's lots of parking facilities nearby here, so. Um, so, so. You know, one of the things that I think is really important is for these people, this project we're studying is sort of an extensive thing, everything from for the parking environment to be to uh, the site selection, and there's a whole group of folks that worked on before the project was on board. Uh, how do you build over a tunnel? How do you deal with the sound? A lot of those issues were fluxed out uh, really early day, so that when we knew uh, they knew and they could decide that it could you know perform the way it needed to perform. And you know, we part of the reason we chose both parking is the first thing people oftentimes look at is say, well, people work in the park. Um, and in Calgary, we totally understand that. And what we found out in this village is that um, there's an expectation that's just as great uh, in terms of where we're going to park Where's the train going to come in? Uh, where's the, uh, you know, my kids go down on the bus. Where's the bus going to park? Like, those, those are all questions. And I, and I think the, uh, the project, whether or not the site would be chosen, uh, uh, I think mean, the project team did a really good job <laughs> of making sure all the user groups are, are satisfied. Uh, you know, uh, the conversation we got into talking about uh, the welcome experience in the library. Uh, we advocated as uh, you know, our company, Carriers and Black Corporation, for this project to be in East Village because that's what we want. Uh, we want a community that's welcome to all. We want a community that's about diversity. We want a community that's about activity. Uh, there's no better partner to showcase what, why that's important to our community uh, than Okay, so I'm going to ask the last question. It's going to be like round and round. Um, so imagine it's 2018, and it's the day of the open. Craig, in one word, and I'm going to ask about the same question. In one word, tell us what you're thinking. No. <laughs> Bill. Just happy. Person. You have to go with relief. <laughs> <laughs>